And Pragnesh Bhatt has joined. Francisco is a dear friend from uh, Milan. Um, he's um, the chief of the um, neuro oncology division um, in neurosurgery uh, in Milan. Uh, Humanitas is, is an amazing place in Milan. I visited there. Um, he's having a great time. There's lots of interesting gadgets that they play with. So, guys, uh, it's, uh, we are honored to have him here today. He's going to be talking about thoracolumbar trauma. Okay, off you go. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, really, thank you to give me this opportunity to take this lecture about the uh, management of thoracolumbar trauma. Um, the incidence uh, we know that is very important is different from uh, each country, obviously. This is the data from Italy. The main things I think that the, the main of the trauma is on the thoracolumbar region between T11 and L1, but we can extend it a little more between uh, T10 to L2 that represent the 25% of the fracture. And uh, almost 50, 20% are associated with neurological deficits. So for a neurosurgeon is a very hot topic, the management of a thoracolumbar fracture. Uh, they, we can recognize different causes and this can change obviously by um, country by for the country but um, car accidents false sports uh, are the main activities and we have to take in mind that some different metabolic disease and um, other um, pathologies that uh, can disrupt the architecture of the vertebral body can also be cause of a vertebral um, fracture that are secondary to this pathology but we can accumulate to this topic to the management um, I start from biomechanics because uh, if we understand some uh, points of biomechanics, we can understand how a fracture can arrive and how we can reconstruct this fracture. So we know that in a normal condition, the fulcrum of the um, loading uh, forces is uh, inside, in the middle of the column. So, um, and usually a normal structure of a vertebral body can absorb this uh, loading sharing. And uh, only with the very high cinetic forces or in uh, some pathologies, we can have some disruption and have the fracture. And uh, usually the compressive strengths are the most important uh, to have a disruption, especially of the vertebral body. So uh, in uh, some condition, we can have uh, a compressive uh, alteration of, the, of uh, the forces and have a fracture on the anterior part. That is the main uh, cause. But uh, if we have to think about the anatomy of the spinal cord, we have to think separately on the different uh, part because in the upper thoracic part, we have a very rigid spine because uh, there is the rib and uh, there is a kyphosis. So the flexion injuries are the most relevant. The thoracolumbar, why is the I, mm, the location where we can observe majorly the, the fracture? Because we change from kyphosis to lordosis. Uh, we can change from a mobile to a mobile um, spinal cord. So the strength and the forces, uh, the, um, the, the load sharing is uh, act in a different way in the different parts of this uh, um, of this uh, uh, tract of the column. While in the lumbar spine, where there is a low doses, the axial loading is the most relevant also because it's the basis of all our column. And depending of the dynamic of the trauma and where the forces can arrive, we can have a disruption of different elements from anterior to the middle part to the posterior part. And they can combine in a different type of uh, uh, fracture. Here we can, uh, I summarize in four main categories uh, according to the type of the fracture from compression, the bus fraction, flexion distraction, and finally the fraction dislocation. The compression fracture, as I said, is the most common, usually is in the anterior part of the vertebral body and uh, is due to a compression of our loading uh, forces. And uh, the most common causes are, are the force and the motor vehicle accidents. But it's the typical fracture of um, osteoporosis because 
I show before a slide where the architecture of the vertebral body is disrupt, is disrupt sorry, and uh, it's not possible to have a good um, load sharing in, through the vertebral bodies. A bus fracture is similar, the mechanism of the fracture is similar, but the cinetic of the force is higher. So all the body is dis is disrupted, especially the posterior element. And this kind of uh, fracture usually is uh, um, associated with neurological injury because we can observe the alteration of the posterior element that can go through the spinal cord uh, to the spinal canal where we can have a spinal cord or nerve at all. Flexion distraction fracture uh, that is typical for the car accident is when we have a flexion movement um, but uh, with an opposition in the anterior part of the body, typical of the set belt injury, uh, because uh, there is something that uh, contrast these forces and the disruption is the, of the posterior elements. So the um, spinal process, the ligaments, but also the pedicle because the fulcrum is just in the posterior part of the vertebral body. And uh, can also associate with the abdominal trauma due to the compression for the seat belt. This is a very typical. And the main location of this fracture is L1 due to the seat belt uh, for sure. Uh, finally, there is the fracture dislocation is the most complex type of fracture and uh, is due to many variation of combination of forces and is the most instable of all the, um, the fracture and they usually is associated with the, a very important neurological uh, deficit. So is a uh, um, very co complex to manage in emergency because we have to consider that there is a very high cinetic uh, uh, trauma uh, and sometimes the patients have also other problems. So it's a very challenging uh, type of fracture. But in clinical practice, we can summarize. Um, it's correct that this uh, uh, webinar is mainly due for residents. It's correct, Salman? Yeah, Agreed. okay. Okay, it's just uh, because uh, some uh, information are more basilar than for uh, experienced surgeon. But just to have uh, the management, uh, we have to consider three main steps. The, the first uh, that is very important is to have a neurological examination. Obviously, when a patient arrives in the emergency department, first of all, we have to stabilize the patient because sometimes in the trauma, we have also other problems. So first of all, to stabilize the patient. After that, we have to have a neurological definition of this condition, then have a diagnosis and a classification of a fracture. And finally, we have to think about uh, the treatment that can be surgical and not. Mm, why is important the neurological examination? Obviously, because uh, we can have different kind of syndrome according if there is a complete or incomplete uh, spinal cord injury, but also because when you are in emergency and you don't have so many time, it's very important, it's crucial to try to define by the clinics the level of the lesion to try to focalize your, um, uh, your exam. Um, it depends from the part of the world. Sometimes the MRI is very hard to have in early management, uh, um, in the early phase of the trauma. So if you are able to focalize where, is, where can be the trauma, you can focalize also your radiological department. About the syndrome, obviously the most, uh, uh, the worst is the complete spinal cord injury, where uh, there is a complete loss of sensory, motor and uh, sphincter dysfunction. And they usually, are uh, associated with, with a very high degree trauma and uh, with dislocation. According to the level, we can recognize a different level of, uh, um, of a plegia that can be complete for a cervical trauma or incomplete partial like a paraplegia from an intermammillary or lower according to the level of the lesion. The incomplete spinal cord injury are, as I said, uh, we can recognize uh, four main uh, syndrome according where is uh, into the spinal cord the damage. Um, the central cord syndrome is the most frequent, usually is associated with the spinal cord trauma. So it's not the topic of this uh, lecture, but uh, 
I, I have to mention about uh, this syndrome, and usually is connected with extension injury of the spine. The anterior core syndrome usually is uh, the part affected is the anterior part of the spinal cord, so we can understand that the flexion injury in this kind of patients is the predominant um, type of injury. And the, um, the syndrome comprised with a motor and sensitivity loss below the level of the lesion, but we have the preservation of the posterior tract, so the proprioceptive, uh, the vibration um, um, sensation. So it's uh, important to discriminate with the neurological exam because in this phase, we are before to obtain an MRI or a CT scan. So it's just to have a um, big idea. The bronze acquired syndrome is a anemic cord injury. So on the left side or on the right side, and they usually is uh, due to the penetrating trauma that arrive from the side and we have just a ipsilateral loss of motor function and proprioceptive vibration while we have a contralateral loss of pain and temperature because there is a different level of the concession of, uh, of the track exactly. Here are some scheme that you can easily recognize. The posterior core syndrome is a very rare correlation, usually is um, due to trauma in, in hyperflexion, but it's very rare to have a pure posterior core syndrome in trauma. But Sometimes it can be happened, especially if it's associated with the tumor, a posterior element tumor of the vertebral canal with a trauma, we can recognize this syndrome, but uh, in daily practice is very rare. Well, the spinal shock is a, com a temporary but complete loss below the level of the lesion of the sensibility, motor, muscle tendon, and reflexes. So it's very important. Usually we observe this and we understand that this is a, a spinal shock after some hours, 12, 24, 14 hours usually. Now we can recognize also alteration of the reflex that can give us an idea of the timing of the trauma if it, it is not arrived directly from the emergency department. And it's very important in my opinion, especially when we have to take uh, to talk between um, different colleagues to have a same way, a same language. So the ASEA classification is a very easy way to classify the spinal cord injury and to transmit information between the anesthetist or all the doctors that are involved in the emergency. So uh, I suggest always to try to classify um, the, the syndrome, but, but also the fracture because so we have a common uh, language. Um, it's very easy because we can recognize five classes from a complete uh, damage that is as a, o, a to as a E that is uh, without any damage. So it's very easy, you can find, and I think it's very important. When we have defined the um, clinical um, exam, we have to move to the radiological department where X-ray and CT scan, I think right now is uh, uh, worldwide uh, possible in uh, almost the, all the main hospital. Well, the MRI in uh, emergency can be very difficult to, to obtain. So sometimes it's very difficult to, uh, to obtain a whole spine MRI. So if uh, we can uh, focalize uh, where is the suspect after the CT scan, uh, that can be very good. When we have uh, performed um, the CT scan, we can find two types of uh, um, situation. One where is uh, the evidence of a fracture, so it's our topic, but we have to remember that there is a, a pathology, a condition that is the shiwara, where we have the spinal cord injury, so patients have symptoms without any documentation of compression, dislocation, fracture, so we have to think about uh, this, that there is also this condition. But when we have a fracture, the other important things is to classify. Why is it important to classify? We can find different kind of classification through the years from the Dennis model to the mother of the whole spine and the thoracic lumbar injury classification. Uh, it's important to try to have uh, uh, a scheme for us to understand what kind of fracture must to be treated and also to communicate, especially if we have to think 
that the patients arrive in a hospital where there is not a neurosurgery department and a way to transfer, we have a common language. I think the most uh, useful and uh, in this phase, the most uh, complete classification is the new how classification that, that fuse the two main important classification, the Felix and the how Magar classification that uh, analyze uh, the different part of the, the vertebral body. So we can recognize the type, a, type E with the vertebral body fracture, type B with the failure of the posterior or anterior tension band. And finally, the type C with the, the destruction uh, fracture. But there is also information about the clinic, clinical status. This because, because uh, final, this is a scheme you can find very easily in, uh, in the web, uh, is uh, available from a home site. So it's very easy, you can uh, print and uh, you have just to have uh, an idea to classify. But why they introduce uh, also the neurological status because uh, we have to think about treatment and uh, there is no a real guideline to how to treat a fracture. There is some algorithm that uh, help us to define if a fracture is, uh, must be managed in a conservative way or must be operated on. But there is also a gray zone where you can choose from non-operative or operative surgery. There is some different algorithm with a, a grading and with a point according to the type of the fracture and to the neurological uh, deficit. This is uh, from the, the AO surgical algorithm from the, the AO. And then you see that the neurological status is very important if you don't have any kind of uh, a neurological deficit, uh, you can think about conservative, but according if the fracture is considered stable or unstable. This is, uh, I, I think it's important, is uh, a way. Also, if uh, the big problem is that uh, it's very difficult to standardize, probably if you give an MRI or a CT scan to different surgeon, there is some difference in classification because some part is not very clear. Uh, so ju just to have uh, some, main information. And I said that there is a gray zone where it's very difficult to understand. So the importance of the MRI is to understand the integrity of this posterior ligament that give another information about the stability of the spinal cord, of the spinal column, sorry. And there is different uh, um, algorithms. So you can find out what do you think is most convenient to the, your daily practice. but um, how we want to arrive here to the treatment. As I said, we can have non-surgical treatment, main of the fracture not, uh, must be treated conservatively. So, but what it's mean, the conservative treatment? Patient must have a bed rest because it reduce the loading share of the, the spinal cord. It's the first objective. The second is the use of a brace of orthosis. And finally, you have to plan a clinical neurological follow-up is very important. The role of the brace is to maintain the spinal alignment, to mobilize the spine during the healing process, and finally to control pain when the patient have his movement just to have food or to go to the bathroom because he have to restrict movement. And according to the level of the fracture, you have to think that each type of uh, um, orthosis have different uh, target. So uh, it's not always uh, correct to use uh, um, a camp uh, orthosis because uh, it's arrived to L1. For, so for a, a, a um, fracture that is below that level, it's better to use a lumbar brace or a tailor that uh, is a wide as a, um, a load sharing. And I think that is a very important point. You have to consider that with the conserva conservative treatment, the time of healing of a vertebral fracture is to range from eight to 12 weeks. So uh, this is the time that you have to say to the patient and where you have to organize your clinical and radiological follow-ups. Because before this date, the fracture, uh, the vertebral body can also have a progression 
and you can have a problem in the late problem according to the um, sagittal alignment to uh, a vertebral fracture that is not correctly healed. So this is a scheme from uh, what can be happen in a conservative treatment. The patient uh, with a, a compressive fracture uh, in a hell, I think is L1, no, is a T12, sorry. And uh, it tried to compensate with, because with the conservative treatment, you are not able to change and to correct the sagittal alignment, but you maintain this. So you can understand that finally you can have some problem correlated with other pathologies, especially in the elderly. This is a, a problem in the healing process of osteoporotic fracture that you can have also other degenerative problem and that you can have an imbalance of the sagittal on the on uh, sagittal plane. While the surgical uh, treatment is uh, for the very unstable or to prevent this kind of the problem. We have many different uh, surgical uh, possibilities that, that can be shared and uh, can be combined as we think is the better way. We can go from a vertebral plastic that is usually the indication for osteoporotic fracture to a 360 degree reconstruction. It depends of uh, what is the type of biomechanical needed for the patient? The aim of the surgery is the compression if there is a, a neurological syndrome, that is uh, the first aim. The second is to stabilize and to reconstruct directly the spinal cord. And according where is the problem, where is the factor, we can have a different type of surgery. Or an anterior fixation or combine the two. Uh, fixation according to what is the biomechanical is this is why I start to speak about biomechanics in uh, this presentation because uh, we have to understand why the vertebral body the vertebral structure is uh, disrupted by the trauma so you can able to understand how to reconstruct this is very important just a few, few words about the timing of the treatment because it is a very debate. There, here, there is some guideline that uh, they said that early management is preferable, but there is not enough evidence to make a conclusion, to make a guideline. But I want just uh, to, to, to present our results of uh, the Spinal Committee, the WFNS Spinal Committee conference uh, about the trauma. And finally, we um, decided that uh, the compressive surgery, so in the case of spinal cord injury, is an effective treatment and must be performed as soon as possible and preferably within the 24 hour. This is a recommendation. It's not a guideline because I said that there is not enough condition to make a guideline, but it's a, the official um, recommendation of the WFNS uh, society. And finally, we arrive to the trauma, uh, to the fracture. What, what kind of procedure we can perform? Uh, I so I show you there is no a unique way to treat the same fracture. This is a, a young male with the non uh, neurological deficit with a I3 fracture. We perform, for example, in this case, because there was not the necessity to perform the compression, uh, a short percutaneous fixation, and in early management, we restore also a little bit of the kyphosis. This is the result, because uh, if you perform surgery um, till 22 hours, is better. the better result to the kyphotic correction is uh, if you perform a surgery from 24 to 48 hour, you can do to uh, with the ligamental passes to reduce the fracture and to correct the kyphotic deformity. And this is the follow up at one year and you can see how the posterior fragment was completely correct due to the ligamental passes. This is uh, a possible way to treat the patient. This is another fracture that start as you can see in the left part is a he one is a old female we treat her with a conservative treatment after at the first for an x-ray follow-up 
you can see that the vertebral body was split, so it became a H2 uh, fracture. So we decided at that moment to perform also a CT scan to perform a short fixation, but is uh, an option. It's not uh, the only way. We can also consider to treat her with a conservative treatment, but just to try to prevent deformity uh, because there was a, a progression of the fracture. And we decided to treat and here you can see that we perform after 15 days, there is no at all correction of the deformity because this is possible only if you perform in early stages of the fracture. Some other cases, probably we can skip this that is most easy and try to thinking about a more complex fracture. I know that uh, after we will have some cases discussion with the uh, Gregory is correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I can uh, go very quick. So we can, we can have more time about discussion that I think is most interesting that uh, don't show some cases. Yeah, um, this is a, a way to treat. Uh, here there is a, um, a B, B2 fracture, so involvement of anterior and posterior elements. So the anterior reconstruction is, uh, is important. The patient refused a major uh, surgery. So we try to give a fixation uh, and stability, the anterior column stability with a vertebral plastic and a short fixation. It's work is not the, probably the most correct way to treat this kind of uh, fracture, but it's a possibility. The anatomy in that case uh, help us because the posterior element was good. So we can, uh, um, we could put a uh, cement inside without any risk to have uh, leakage into the spinal uh, canal. And this is the, the, the CT scan control. And uh, that was performed in uh, early stages and uh, we restore 88 eight degrees of lower dosage. This is uh, pretty good. More complex cases, uh, B2 fracture in a young female, the problem is that often the trauma in the vertebra is not only of a one vertebral body, but can comprise two or three. So we have to think that uh, we have to um, we have some A1 fracture, but we can have also uh, other very complex uh, fracture like the B2 because uh, the one below the B2 fracture is a, a an A1 fracture. So. We have to think about all the type of the fracture to think to how to treat. This is the MRI that you can show two fracture of the two level. And in that case, it was performed a long fixation to try to avoid a double level uh, corpectomy because if you perform a, a corpectomy of the B2 vertebral body, you cannot put a cage on a um, a fracture um, vertebral body. So in that case, it was managed with a long posterior fixation. She was young, so the healing process uh, goes on going very good. This is another case. You have three different kind of fracture. Uh, A3 that is the on the um, top level, while the two one uh, A1 uh, fracture on uh, below uh, was performed. Again, a posterior fixation, a percutaneous fixation, just to avoid the um, a free level corpectomy that probably it seems uh, too um, invasive in that case, also because it is a young male. So we don't, we was not too aware about uh, failure of the system. But the patient, uh, after two months from the surgery, had a second trauma. So the, uh, he had a mobilization of the um, the screws of the below level and a new fracture again of the vertebra that was not completely healed. Yeah, the uh, example you can see on the left, I was after surgery and this is after two months and the screw loosening. So in that case, in the meantime, the below level was completely healed. So we perform um, a combined approach and we we put uh, an expandable cage that make subsidence just at the beginning. Probably the quality of the bone um, was not so good, but finally, this is the reconstruction, but finally after one year, 
the healing process is good and we have a fusion without any other level so that can you can consider also that sometimes your plan can have some problem during the uh, follow-up time and finally uh, the most um, tricking uh, treatment is the circumferential reconstruction for the most complex uh, uh, fracture you have to think that uh, the load sharing we have seen of the biomechanics of the spine is to the anterior part of the colon. So if uh, the disruption is on that part, we have to think about uh, reconstruction of the anterior part. Usually we can reach the anterior part by a combined approach posterior for a fixation and anterior to make the corpectomy and um, and the reconstruction. This is one of the first cases that I performed some years ago. It's very, you can see it's very invasive. Now it's possible to perform also with a less invasive approach, also a combined approach. And the final, you can perform um, a good reconstruction from anterior and posterior element. This is the final X-ray. But uh, in the last years, uh, um, I tried to understand if there is a less invasive approach because uh, to make an anterior approach, sometimes you need a thoracic surgeon or the general surgeon for the lumbar part. And uh, I try to minimize, not my, uh, myself, because this is a familiar approach for many surgeons, to perform a circumferential reconstruction by a posterior only uh, approach. Also because the anatomy is on the right side is uh, our anatomy, the anatomy that uh, we are used uh, than the anterior one is less invasive because uh, um, we manage everything by uh, posterior. Yeah, just to show you that there is many, many papers that uh, show this part of uh, um, approach. And this, I go very quick. You can perform also a monolateral approach if you don't have to decompress, preserve the posterior tension band, like in this case, you put the, your uh, your screw, uh, the structure just to give uh, stabilization, a cranial caudal discectomy. Then I use the navigation. It's not uh, obligatory, mandatory to use it, but it's help. I perform uh, the corpectomy through the pedicle of the broken vertebra with the drill. I check mm -hmm. with the navigation when I am arrived. This is the final canal. Then finally, I put an expandable cage. Into this hole, this is the most complex part because you have a very small uh, uh, hole through the dura sac and the uh, nerve root here, where is the uh, yellow star is the nerve root. This is the footprint just to understand. And finally, you have to protect the dura sac and the nerve root and put your cage. I want to show you um, that in this phase that is very tricky, you have to change orientation of your uh, cage positioning. At the beginning, you can see that the instrument is from medial to lateral, just to insert the hole, while the cage is inserted into the, um, the, the hole. I start to change orientation of the instruments and finally I go from lateral to medial when the cage is below the nerve root, so in a safe way, and I put inside. So if you have seen how they change, you can really understand how you can oh, angulate the uh, instruments to put in a safe way the, the cage into a very, very small hole. Obviously, it's very tricky in uh, upper thoracic part. You can clip also your nerve root so you have a, a more space, while from T9 to S1, it's not possible. You have to try to avoid this uh, to prevent a neurological um, deficit. Obviously, it's uh, challenging. You, have, uh, you need an expandable cage, otherwise it's very difficult. In, and in L5, you have to consider the sucker slope due to the angulation of the cage itself. This is uh, probably the most complex case that I manage with this approach, a very complex uh, um, C fracture of two vertebral bodies with an hematoma, the, the patient will complete uh, had a complete uh, spinal cord injury. And this is the final uh, reconstruction. So it's also possible to perform a two level corpectomy by a posterior approach. And uh, uh, this is a, a 
a recovery surgery, the, the patient was operating on by other surgeon, the fracture doesn't heal, so we perform this approach and we obtain also a correction of the kephotic. Yeah, I have some questions. You asked me some questions, so tell me how do you want to proceed? If there is a bit more some question about the presentation before my question to audience. Uh, we will, we, what we will do is we will do these questions afterwards. Um, okay. First, we will, we can, we'll take questions and uh, Greg and Doug, uh, hi, you both are there. So the, the combo is back. Uh, and they will, hi, hi, good to see you. Good Doug. morning. Uh, good evening, by the way. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we just um, drag your butts out of bed. So, <laughs> so um, uh, carry on. Gonna, you, can, I, can I just ask Francisco one one question to start with? Yes. Um, as we as we get into, I see that you do a lot of uh, percutaneous instrumentation um, across, and then and then don't do any fusion with it. Do you go back and take the screws out later? Sorry, because sorry I put uh, my microphone up more. Can you repeat? Okay. Yes, you do a lot of percutaneous instrumentation of, of fractures, and at least that's what it, it looks like. And I don't, uh, and I don't see any fusion um, in those areas. So do you go back and remove the screws later on since you're instrumenting across a non-fused segment? Yeah, when I perform open surgery, obviously I perform also posterior fusion. When I perform percutaneous, uh, I, it's not a, a fusion uh, procedure, but just for uh, the healing process of the vertebral body. While on the, um, I do perform a minimal invasive lateral approach. Uh, so in that case, uh, I think uh, it's necessary to perform a kind of fusion, posterior fusion, but uh, I never perform a minimal invasive percutaneous or lateral approach uh, for fractures. So uh, in all the cases that I show, the fusion is uh, by an anterior, if there is a cage, I use the bone that I remove from the vertebral body to obtain fusion and I obtain also posterior uh, fusion. While in the percutaneous uh, is not, uh, I, I not perform fusion, but just to try to stabilize the column and uh, to obtain a natural uh, healing of the fracture, but uh, is some, uh, in some cases. But do you go back at a later point in time and remove the instrumentation yeah. since in, there in, is no fusion? Yeah, in, in young patients, if the, um, the vertebral fracture is completely healed, I remove uh, and nothing else. If there is no fusion, uh, and uh, you have to perform a recurrence uh, surgery, a remove, and uh, you have to obtain the fusion in uh, some way for, for sure. Okay. Uh, okay. So hopefully you guys can see this. There's yeah, we can. Share. Yeah, we see okay. it, Greg. All right. Oh, Doug, do you have your terrible uh, internet connection again? Uh, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any more questions for um, Greg? Are you, are you looking at the chat? Yeah, no, I was I thought we were going to do cases. Yeah, we will, but if there are any questions, uh, let me just go through some of the questions. Go, go through them because I'm just trying to. Uh, so, uh, Francisco, there's a question from Bichari Yakubi who's saying, What is your indication for kyphoplasty in trauma cases? Okay, uh, I don't love at all uh, kyphoplastic, uh, so um, I don't use uh, a lot. I, I think uh, it's a good indication uh, um, in early phases uh, of the, the fracture because uh, you can, uh, with the balloon, obtain the restoring of the height of the vertebral bodies. And uh, in my experience, uh, we perform just uh, in some osteoporotic uh, patient, not to hold, obviously, uh, because I don't like at all uh, in a young patient to put uh, acrylic cement. So it, this is why I don't use uh, at all uh, capoplastic. But, uh, but it's the same concept, I think, for the percutaneous fixation. If the same indication, a young patient with a, a little collapse of vertebral body in the early phases of the um, trauma, you can. Uh, 
really restore the hide and in that way you can put uh, cement it's just uh, my feeling about acrylic cement in the in the young patients while the biological cement is too really too expensive and is very difficult to to have for a pay, um, young patient also if i think probably is the best indication because if you don't have instrumentation the it's just a percutaneous with two needles, uh, so uh, I think can be uh, a good solution in, in some cases, but uh, really it's very close to our percutaneous indication, the first cases that I show, uh, that I show you. Okay, so there's another question. If you've got an Asia A patient, uh, yes. would you perform percutaneous uh, screws and rely on ligament texas? Yeah, uh, this can, it depends from the fractures because uh, if it's too long, the instrumentation that I need, I don't love uh, at all the percutaneous fixation because uh, the, the, the reducing maneuver is uh, more complex and especially to put the rod, if you have a four, five, six level of fixation may be very complex. So in that case, uh, because uh, the fracture is very important, I prefer um, an open procedure also to obtain fusion, a posterior fusion, if uh, I don't go uh, by anterior part. While uh, if a very short fixation, uh, yes, I, I do in, uh, in this way. Okay, and there's a question from Dr. Tower. He's asking, um, TP fixation for correction of kyphotic deformity. And he's asking what degree of uh, correction you get by TP fixation when you're trying to do kyphotic deformity correction. And how many degrees um, uh, of cob angle would you be able to correct by short fixation or long fixation? Oh, uh, obviously with, so, with short fixation, uh, the correction is not too high. Uh, I show you some cases uh, was uh, till six to eight degrees, also because uh, uh, is the indication of a, a short fixation, in my opinion, obviously. While uh, when uh, you perform a very long fixation, you are able to, and in an open surgery in that case, you are able to correct uh, um, more degrees, also because uh, the forces that uh, the, the new instrumentation that uh, are on the market uh, allow you really to perform a very important correction also more than 20 degrees of kyphotic, kyphotic uh, deformity with distraction and reduction. So it's, it's really also because uh, the vertebra is broken. So the, the column is uh, in time, if you have many degrees, uh, usually is uh, because uh, you have also disruption of the ligaments. And so you are able to make also very important uh, the compression. Otherwise, if you have to perform Mm, correction of many degrees, you can disrupt the posterior element just to help you and then to obtain in that part of the fusion. So uh, it, it depends on what, by the type of the trauma really. And uh, so it, with short fixation, I think more than 10 degrees is quite impossible and it's not necessary usually due to the indication of a, a short fixation. Otherwise, it's an incorrect uh, solution to perform a, a short fixation if you have uh, a more than uh, 15 degrees of uh, kyphotic deformity. You need more strength structure. Okay. There's a question about thoracolumbar junction fractures. That do you use uh, pedicle screws in the fracture segment by reducing the screws to six instead of eight? Yeah. If, if it's possible, yes, I, I like to put uh, a screw, a short, if uh, it's not possible to make a, a long screw, a short screw, just uh, to reduce the forces for the correction. So in that case, uh, I, I put a, at, at least one, sometimes uh, you cannot put uh, both screw, but at least one just to um, obtain a, a better load sharing of the forces uh, to the instrumentation and the fracture. Okay, we have a last question. There's Gerald Musa who's raising his hands and want to ask a question. I'm, I'm unmuting him. Gerald, would you like to ask a question, please? Oh, hello. Gerald, yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. No, thank, you very, thank you very much for the very good lecture. It's a very informative, thank you. Uh, my, my question is on the spinal shock. 
um, what are some of the factors that you consider when you get a patient with spinal shock? Since um, some, some literature say that you can have spinal shock that lasts even after 24 hours. So how do you go around your surgical management with regard to spinal shock? I'm sorry, but uh, the the quality was not good of the my microphone. Can you repeat? Because I hear some just yes. the beginning at the end of the question. Sorry. Okay. Uh, is it clear now? Yeah, a little bit better. Okay. So uh, my question is with regard a patient with spinal shock. Okay. Uh, it, it's very difficult to tell the extent of cord injury in spinal shock. And some literature says that a patient can have spinal shock lasting more than even more than 24 hours. So, how do you plan your surgical management with regard to a patient with a spinal shock? Hi, this is a very pertinent question because I think it's very hard um, to find um, a unique response about this kind of patient because uh, if uh, on one hand uh, you, we have seen that the early surgery early management provide better results for the um, neurological recovery on the other hand this kind of patient have also other problems and uh, the early management may be difficult so it depends if uh, uh, what is the clinical practice, the, the clinical uh, picture of the trauma? Um, I try to obtain all the neuroradiological information about these uh, uh, patients, uh, especially the MRI. Uh, sometimes uh, you have to fight to obtain a wall MRI if uh, the level of suspicion is more than one level. Um, so the first uh, part of the answer is is try to obtain all the information before to come to the operating room according to the facilities of uh, your hospital because uh, this is uh, another key point because I can say to you that uh, you need to have an x-ray, a, a complete CT scan, a complete MRI but uh, if to obtain this uh, you need uh, one week uh, I think that is not an answer so you have to think about the facilities to try to obtain all the information the, from a clinical point of view and a radiological point of view and try to manage patient by patient. Also because every patient, every trauma patient is different one to the each other. So you have to think about uh, that specific case, uh, that specific fracture, if there is a compression, what kind of compression is, uh, and uh, to think about this. Because if you have a complete spinal cord injury, um, due to dislocation, probably an early surgery doesn't change uh, at all uh, the neurological recovery of the patient. So while an early surgery may the patient have uh, more blood losses, so you have to consider if there is also um, other trauma, other um, injuries. So uh, the management is around the patient. We have to think about the patient and that that specific patient that that I show you are just. Uh, general indication but after you have to think uh, specific for the patients yeah i think uh, you have to because this is a separate topic in itself mm -hmm. spinal shock and if you talk about it we'll be here yeah, forever but... we, we're going to have a comment from but doug i make, I make one i'll make one one comment um sure. so if you look at if you look at indications for surgery some of the spinal shock on a telix score is going to be either two or three just for starters. And that's without even looking at posterior ligamentous complex and, and morphology. So, you know, those patients are all gonna end up having surgery unless there's something really uh, un unusual about their, uh, their, their, their fracture morphology. Uh, but so spinal shock probably doesn't, doesn't matter in those cases. You know, they have a bad injury and they're likely gonna require surgery, whether it's for stabilization or potentially neurologic recovery. And Doug? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that, the, you know, the, I think that the data, although not conclusive, is, is clear that earlier is better, both from a standpoint of neurologic recovery, but also a lot of these patients have significant pulmonary injury and things like that. And so just the ability to mobilize the patients, I think, cuts a lot of the postoperative complications. And so, you know, and I, I don't really personally think that much in terms of spinal shock. If they've got a severe cord injury and they've got compression, I want them decompressed and stabilized. Okay. 
Shall we move on to um, uh, the cases? Thank you, Francisco. Good. It was a wonderful talk. Really enjoyed it.